Hi, everybody. I'm Bob Bowman, editor in chief of Supply Chain Brain. I want to welcome you to this webinar presentation on the logistics of disaster relief presented by Redwood Logistics. One quick note there will be a question and answer session at the end of the presentation. So, audience members are encouraged to submit their questions at any time during the presentation, and we'll take as many questions as we can, time permitting, at the end. Just click on that QA button at the bottom of your screen. Now, when natural disasters hit, providing the necessary resources for, for relief can quickly become a logistics nightmare. Good logistics is essential to effective disaster response operations. So today, we're going to discover, with the help of three industry experts, how the world of logistics can band together with nonprofit disaster relief organizations to ensure that people receive immediate assistance and supplies and how supporting these humanitarian efforts can strengthen your company's bottom line. With that, I want to introduce our speakers for today. Kathy Fulton is Executive Director of the American Logistics Aid Network, or ALLEN. She leads the organization in facilitating donations of logistics services and equipment to enable delivery of millions of dollars worth of humanitarian aid. Kathy served as the organization's director of operations from 2010 until her promotion in 2014. Sandra McCarthy is director of global transportation and customs compliance at Walgreens. Sandra's dynamic career is focused on building and advising organizations in global trade. Her experience encompasses procurement of international transportation services, sales, communications, strategic planning, operational execution, and organizational building skills. Adam Moreau is Executive Vice President of Sales Operations at Redwood Logistics. As an industry veteran with over 15 years of experience, Adam oversees Redwood's brokerage and business operations units growth and development. Adam also works with Redwood's technology leadership group to develop comprehensive roadmaps for product adoption among Redwood's customer and carrier base. So let me start out with you, Kathy Fulton of Allen. Could you just set the stage for us? Give us an idea of just what it is we're facing today in terms of the cost, scope, and frequency of weather and climate disasters. Yeah, Bob, thank you so much for, for that. And it's exactly as you said, we know that um, disasters are increasing in scope and scale. Uh, if we look back over just the past um, three years, there have been 56 events that have caused more than a billion dollars worth of damages. In 2021 alone, we had 20 disasters that were uh, weather or climate related that caused over a billion dollars in damages. And these are things you know, that may seem like they're small, a tornado in one area or something huge like Hurricane Ida. Um, but these disasters are becoming more complex in scope, scope and scale. Um, and we're also seeing more compound disasters. And by that, I mean, we're still dealing with the after effects of the pandemic. Um, we are uh, looking at war in Ukraine, which is causing global supply chain ripples. And we have record inflation. And it, if we have another active hurricane season this summer, we're going to be dealing with, um, with those repercussions on top of everything that we're already facing with uh, trying to operate our supply chains. So it's a, a really um, increasingly uh, more difficult and challenging environment just for businesses to operate. When you throw in trying to uh, support uh, survivors who've been affected by a crisis, it becomes even more challenging. So with that, I'll turn it back to you, Bob. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Kathy, for painting that picture as distressing as it looks. Uh, I want to start out by kicking off the uh, panel discussion portion of our presentation here with a question for the entire panel. Let me start with you again, Kathy. Please tell me about the role that you play in disaster relief. Yeah, so you, you, know, you kind of shared my bio about being the executive director and, and leading the organization, but let me tell you a little bit more about what Allen or American Logistics Aid Network does. So we were really formed by a group of industry associations to be the point, uh, to be the lead for logis the logistics and supply chain industry for disaster response. We do that in a few different ways. Um, our primary mission really is to serve disaster survivors by using smart supply chain principles and well-coordinated logistics solutions. Um, we also help to provide educational resources so that supply chain 
um, resilience activities are enhanced, as well as just knowledge around humanitarian logistics in general. Um, uh, you know, operating in complex environments requires a lot of uh, information, and so we help provide some of that information to enable better decision making. And then we, because we were formed to be that unifying body, we bring everybody together. We work with our industry association partners. We bring them together to talk about the challenges that they and their members are facing on an ongoing basis. So that's kind of the role that, that we're playing before, during, and after disaster. I just have to say at the risk of editorializing, I've been so impressed with the work of Alan over the years. You guys do great work. It's so important what, what role you're playing. Thanks for that. Yeah. Sandra McCarthy of Walgreens, please tell me the role that you play in disaster relief. Absolutely. Yeah. So Walgreens is one of the nation's largest drugstore chains with over 9,200 stores that provide health and beauty retail sim- solutions to communities. So we regularly face natural disasters. In my role, I'm responsible for import logistics, import customs compliance, domestic inbound transportation, and reverse logistics. I lead a a pretty big team of 24 people, and our priorities are getting the product into our stores in a timely manner. And so as part of that, my team's responsibilities also include managing the shipments that go to our stores on Hawaii, Alaska, the U.S. Virgin Islands, and Puerto Rico. And during disasters, we work with carriers to get products and emergency supplies delivered to both our distribution centers and our stores. And also, our Walgreens transportation team includes our fleet directors, Rodney Wilson, Ed Schultes, and Chris Whitehurst, who manage our store deliveries, and they play a very large role in navigating the complexities of disaster relief. Their teams very often will work around the clock to respond to the constantly changing circumstances during a natural disaster. The company's first priority though is the safety of the team members and our customers. And throughout events, Walgreens will conduct wellness checks on all their team members in impacted areas and offer support services to those who are displaced or needing provisions. And Walgreens also at the corporate level has donation programs established with relief organizations where both supplies and funds are donated both from our company and at our checkout counters. Never a dull moment. I think I could say that with confidence based on what you just said, Sandra. Adam Moreau, Redwood Logistics, why don't you chime in with uh, the role that you play in disaster relief, please? Yeah, it's a good piggyback on what uh, Sandra just said. Obviously, my a good portion of my role is our overall customer experience and our overall customer execution. So um, we're a big part of making sure that everything that Sandra just mentioned delivers on time, right? Um, supporting and servicing uh, the disaster relief efforts that our customer base is trying to accomplish is, is certainly within our core focus at Redwood. So, you know, we're, we're here to make sure that um, the initiatives and everything that our customers are trying to do for disaster relief go off without a hitch. Um, and that's really what we're here to provide for everybody. Thanks so much. I'd like to direct this next question to the entire panel once again, again, starting with you, Kathy. And here it is. Whether it's earthquakes on the West Coast or tornadoes in the Midwest or hurricanes in the Southeast, as Kathy just told us, we've seen an uptick in natural disasters over the few last few years. What are some of the more successful examples you've seen of supply chains supporting communities during these difficult times? How do you think we can improve even more going forward? Kathy? Yeah, and I love that Sandra talked about how they're working to keep their employees safe and how to keep their businesses operating because Truly the best way that supply chains can serve communities affected by crisis is by being resilient. We want those pre-existing supply chains, those pre-disaster supply chains to stay open. And that means, whether that means, you know, that the, the grocery store, the food bank stay open, right? Whatever organizations are in the community pre-disaster, we want those, we want those uh, to continue operating or, you know, the power plant or the water uh, utility, we want those to keep functioning because that resilience in and of itself is gonna do more for that community than any replacement supply chain, any humanitarian, you know, disaster relief supply chain, whether it's government or nonprofit ever could. Now, that being said, my job depends a lot on working with those nonprofit organizations and helping them to provide support to communities. So that being said, we do see a huge amount of generosity from the business community, from the corporate world after disaster. Um, and you can see, you know, Sandra talked about their uh, corporate philanthropy efforts. And we're 
proud to be a part of helping to make some of those connections. And that means things like directing donations of bottled water after the, the freeze in Texas last year or uh, water filters uh, for Flint a few years ago. Um, even, even more recently at the beginning of this year, you know, Western Kentucky saw some pretty intense tornado activity and we were able to help support um, getting material handling equipment, which is really a force enabler, right, to get things moving in a community. Um, my point with that is that all of those things require someone in a supply chain role to think beyond their day job of uh, shareholder profitability and really think about their friends and neighbors in the community and those folks who need a boost during a difficult time. Um, in every situation that I described, whether it was, you know, Flint or Texas or, or Kentucky, um, there were good supply chain principles at work, right? There was a strong demand signal. Something had happened. We knew what was needed. We knew where it was needed, when it was needed, by whom. Um, there was an identified source of supply, whether it was the bottled water organizations or the material handling companies. Uh, there was a clear distribution plan, and this is where the community organizations and those nonprofit humanitarian organizations come in because they're the ones on the ground doing that work. And there needed to be someone, and in this case, it was the team at Allen, who was able to put together all of those pieces. Um, so I, I'll, I'll pause there because I don't, I don't, I could talk about this stuff for hours, Bob, as you know, I can, but I, 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 want, <laughs> I want to make sure that we hear about the, the great work that Sandra and Adam are doing as well. Yeah, me too. Okay. S Sandra, you know, Walgreens network is so vast. I mean, you have so much of a network to oversee such a challenge just with the sheer size of it, but what have you seen? Can you cite some examples from, from within that network of some really interesting uh, supporting community efforts and what, what have you seen out there? Absolutely. So for retailers, the most effective relief responses specific to supply chain logistics involve having a defined and published business continuity plan in advance, a process to monitor the event, which is usually weather, a solid plan for fuel for both our fleet trucks and our carrier partners, and a plan to protect employees and assets. And then finally, a robust communication plan. Some of the examples of the successes at Walgreens are we deployed mobile pharmacies to support the Gulf Coast after the hurricanes this past year and delivered water to the American Red, Red Cross. We were also the first transportation company that was up and running after the Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico. And recently, a Walgreens store was even used to shelter people and fight the fires during the wildfires on the West Coast. We've delivered product by non-mainland carriers, third-party carriers, internal methods, and, and drone delivery may not be that far off for critical items for disaster relief. My peers in transportation feel like we do a really good job of responding, and so do a lot of other companies. The opportunity that exists is in coming together with other companies and suppliers to combine our efforts. And forums like this to share ideas and learn more from others is a great example of how we can improve. One of the best strategies to have is to have suppliers and partnerships established well in advance, as Kathy had already mentioned. And for us, Redwood, Redwood is a perfect example of that for Walgreens. We've been doing business with them for over 19 years, and they've helped us with FEMA donation loads, store runs with water, first aid and batteries, and they've done crazy things like deliver water all the way from Dallas to our DCs in Orlando, Jupiter, and Nazareth, Pennsylvania. Wow, that's fantastic. And of course, Adam, you are in the logistics business. You are in the trenches, ground zero. I don't know what metaphor to use, but it comes down to you folks to respond at times like this. So tell me about your experience, some interesting uh, successful examples in, from, from your perspective. Yeah, I mean, not to mention obviously what we've done for, for Sander and Walgreens, but there's a lot of examples of that, right? Not to be overly broad, um, but you know, I think every truck delivered in, in those in need you know, is a success story. I think um, this isn't stocking goods on shelves. This is medical supplies, this is food, water, shelter in some cases, clothing, you know, in the field. And I think um, things that many of us easily take um, for granted on a normal day become super critical to communities suffering some of the worst disasters imaginable, right? And, and how can we improve? Um, you know, in many cases for us, minutes and hours matter more on those routes compared to anything else we have going on um, in our supply chains. So, you know, responding as quickly as possible is important, um, but also making sure 
that these shipments have real-time visibility so people can plan their recovery efforts accordingly um, is, is super critical as well. Unpredictability is, is not in anyone's best interest you know, in dire times. So I think the, the more we can provide that certainty um, down to the minutes and hours, um, you know, that's, that's what's most important during these times. Everyone can benefit if we are obviously delivering on time, but providing that, that visibility and that reliability throughout the course of, of these, these uh, disaster efforts. Thanks, Adam. Let me stay with you, Adam, on this next question. You know, the logistics industry has evolved quite a lot over the last several years, thanks to new technology, which optimizes our day-to-day -day functions. Can you speak about Redwood's increased focus on tech and connectivity, and how can that be utilized in the midst of natural disasters? Yeah, um, absolutely. For us, and, and most simply put, um, you know, the, the two most important factors in disaster relief are speed and reliability, right? You really need both, I think, to be a true partner for these kinds of critical missions um, for those in, in pretty immediate need. Um, and I think on one side, tech has really increased our speed to capacity, you know, which inherently then creates more capacity for, for a tech-connected 3PL, um, which is obviously very important to our clients in these situations because it's often many loads across the same lane and you need to be able to handle that kind of volume surge no matter where it's coming from um, and confidently right and our digital connections to, to thousands of carriers um, help us reach this carrier base either all of them or or a subset of them instantly and i think um, you know in terms of disaster recovery speed is great but you have to deliver right there's no room for failure um, you have to be as close to perfect as possible and the better that your tech is supported by um, you know, data intelligence, data science, the, the better we can provide our customers with the, the best fit carriers for such important shipments by applying the right filters, right? To only utilize the most optimally selected carriers through the carriers that are you know, you know, sort of predetermined to be worthy of this kind of expectation um, becomes really, really important in these times of needs. I think, um, so again, twofold, speed and reliability um, in our experience are, are, are really paramount. Um, and our tech has definitely helped us, you know, excel in both of those in times of need. Thanks. You know, Sandra, you've told us about some of the things that Walgreens has done so far internally, but I wonder if you could also speak to the importance of supporting community relief efforts. How do you liaise with those various organizations and groups from a company perspective? Absolutely. So Walgreens has always been very dedicated to caring for our employees and customers during emergency situations. It's in our DNA as a company. And this can involve more than just getting emergency supplies to our stores and employees. It's also about getting our stores back up and running as quickly as possible to ensure that people have access to life-saving medications that they might, de that they might need. It's also about checking on employees and making sure that they're safe and they have shelter. After the, the hurricane in 2017 in, in Puerto Rico, um, Walgreens donated supplies such as over-the-counter medicine, uh, personal hygiene items, baby formula, and sunscreen to emergency shelters in the region, and donated water to the cities in Puerto Rico. And we also accepted customer donations at the checkout for the American Red, Qua Red Cross. In 2021, Walgreens teamed up with the organization AmeriCares to launch a program called Hope is in Your Hands, which will provide 10 million hand washes to underserved families and communities in need. And Walgreens also has a longstanding partnership with Feed the Children and Feeding America, and has been donating shelf-stable consumables, cosmetics, back-to-school items, beauty and personal items to these organizations for over 20 years. And many employees at Walgreens feel that supporting communities in need is one of the most rewarding parts of our job, and you get to really see that you are making a difference. Kathy, you told us a little bit about the origins of Allen, but I'd like to learn more. Just to, you know, basically, you guys are all about providing supply chain assistance to disaster relief organizations. Tell me just how it really all started. How did you get off the ground with this effort, and what impact of the organization have you seen over the many years that you've been in business or in, in operation? Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, it really was, it really took a disaster to get us motivated. Um, <laughs> Uh, so I, I mentioned that we were formed by industry. There were 13 industry associations, including all of the ones that uh, our callers probably uh, belong to. Uh, and they got together at a conference right after Hurricane Katrina in 2005. And they said, you know, oh, 
this is this is very frustrating to us. People are dying. We're, you know, literally as professionals, we move widgets around the world. Why can't we get food to the Superdome? Right. It just it was a, a mind blowing question for for them to consider, right? And so. Um, that was really the genesis for Alan, just figuring out how can we use the skills and the expertise and knowledge of the supply chain professional community um, to help after, before, during, and after a crisis. And that's evolved, you know, in the in the past 17 years. Um, just a few metrics for you: we've been able to deliver over a hundred million dollars in humanitarian aid. Um, and we've responded to disasters like Harvey, Irma, and Maria in 2017. Sandra talked about that. You know, that I think I still have battle scars from Hurricane Maria. Um, but, yeah, but things like the Haiti earthquake and the pandemic, um, e Ebola in West Africa. Um, uh, but we've also responded to disasters, you know, those that were caused by natural causes and disasters that have unfortunately been caused by human hands, right? Mm -hmm. um, we've been able to help hundreds of thousands of disaster survivors, and that's not an exaggeration. You know, I, I think we'll probably reach a million here in the next 18 months, um, but across six continents. And that's pretty cool. I was, I was looking at the stats the other day and, and saying, you know, we haven't been to Antarctica yet, but it's coming, um, especially <laughs> especially with global warming, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, and just just in the past two years alone, we've worked with seventy nonprofit organizations, including every single one that uh, Sandra mentioned. We've we've helped them in some way, shape, or form, either through um, helping co coordinate logistics for them or helping them with information resources. So it, I love to see, I love to hear the same names over and over and over again. Um, but I also say the, the impact really goes beyond just kind of those metrics that I shared, um, because we get to see the impact of employees within these companies recognizing that, you know, the skills that they use for commercial purposes are the same skills that are needed in disaster response. Um, really, when supply chain professionals, we have this unique ability to see challenges before they happen, I think. Um, but we're also uh, special people in that we're nimble and we react quickly. I, I love to tease my emergency management friends and say, you know, um, not every emergency manager understands logistics, but every logistician understands disaster because every day a truck doesn't show up or right. a load shifts or something like that. Um, but, I'll, yeah. Go ahead, Bob. No, no, please finish your thought. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll just close with this to say that, um, you know, it really goes beyond moving boxes. Um, and I hope that the work we do with our educational activities and our decision making resources and bringing people together, uh, we really want that to be the larger impact that the organization has. We truly want to change how disaster response preparedness and recovery happens. Um, it, because our, our, you know, our belief and, and a truism is that um, if we can reduce suffering and we can reduce waste because we're using good supply chain principles um, and, and help disaster survivors more efficiently, it, that's the best type of impact that any of our organizations can hope for. Well, Kathy, I'm wondering, as is the case with humans and organizations, we all get better with experience. We learn lessons along the way. Maybe we make mistakes, we correct, we just get better. What lessons can you say that you've learned from the birth of Alan to now? Maybe hard-won lessons, to be sure, <laughs> but things that you do better now because of your experience over these many years. Yeah, I, I, I hate to say this, considering you just asked Adam about technology, but my answer really is... It, there's not a technology solution for everything. And it's mm. really, you have to focus on relationships. I know that's something that Redwood does extremely well. Um, it, it's not just, um, you, can't, you can't just, you know, set up the computers to talk to each other and expect that people are going to get served on the other end. Um, so really thinking about how do we build networks of relationships? How do we bring people together? How do we, um, how do we help people collaborate more efficiently? I think that is a lesson from, you know, from our beginning, we thought, yep, we're going to, we're going to apply technology and, and, you know, disaster relief is going to be miraculous. That's, there are absolutely technical solutions that help along the way. Adam mentioned visibility. I, that's a huge one, being able to you know, see things uh, as they're coming. 
Um, but really at our core, it is improving on, and growing those relationships every, every single day. I wanna talk more about this idea of helping actual communities before and after natural disasters. And maybe Sandra, you can address this about some innovative ways that logistics leaders and organizations can do that. You're on the ground, you're dealing with people, you're dealing with communities on a, an emergency basis. There's no time to take a breath. Again, before and after too, the follow-ups. Tell me a little bit about how Walgreens kind of works with local communities in this manner. Yep. So some of the innovative ways that logistics organizations can help communities is by being proactive through continually monitoring weather events and distributing supplies in advance. And Kathy really touched on this and how critical and important it is. And it's really staging things in those areas where, where those supplies are already there so that communities are better prepared before the event. Also, I would say establishing a critical event SWAT team that continually plans and reroutes while circumstances are changing rapidly during any scenario, and that's another strategy. Also, leveraging both internal and external capabilities, like our partnership with Redwood, to enable the fastest response that you can to areas that need it the most. Um, we also recently subscribed to a more robust monitoring service that provides real-time information to track weather data and local events more effectively. And it will also include weather forecasts. And finally, I would say being creative, just like you mentioned, to find those solutions that you need when, when we're, um, like when we had a, a store that was uh, closed that we converted to a shelter and we had cats and showers and food items for people. Just really thinking out of the box and, and having those creative solutions. And another example is when one of our truck drivers found a refrigerated truck to deliver cold water to people who had been without power for days. So these are just some of the ways that, that you can be creative and enhance a disaster response. What about you, Adam? I mean, you guys, you're a private company for that matter. You're a business. How do you work with communities before and after natural disasters? What can you do and what role can you play in that? I think you're muted. I think you're muted, Adam. Sorry about that. Yeah, not there to you piggyback go. exactly under what uh, Sandra said, but yeah, I totally agree. I think I think how to help after a natural disaster has been discussed, right? We know that speed, reliability, um, to Kathy's point, we got to make sure that we have the relationships built beforehand so we know who to turn to, um, you know, and, and who to trust in these, uh, these times of needs. But, um, you know, I think beforehand, if I'm going to talk about one of my earlier points, speed, a lot of times speed is, is a direct result of local supplies, right? I'm not saying this is real, realistic for um, all supply chains and, and might be a bit of a reach for many companies. But to Sandra's point, being a large shipper that's really focused on disaster relief and, and super innovative and thoughtful you know, strategies could certainly place um, you know, some more emphasis on making sure during the expected times of the year where certain disasters are more prone in certain areas. Um, I think additional inventory management in those regions during those times would be, uh, would be a great way to support a disaster, right? And make sure that the, the speed to delivery um, is really cut down by bringing in more regionalized and localized product, right? I think, um, again, just having access to that ahead of time where it's not gonna go to waste there anyway, right? But just having it on site or closer to on site, um, I think really puts, puts those communities at risk um, in a better position ahead of time. Um, and that, that's really a, a great innovative way to plan ahead for what is obviously very tough to plan for. But if we know where it's coming, most likely we know what time of the year it's coming at, um, we can do our part in that sense to make sure that we at least have what's on site close enough to, to reach um, very quickly. And yet the best laid plans are often subject to some degree of chaos by the very nature yeah. of disasters and emergencies. Kathy, for that matter, I mean, you guys are skilled. You know what you're doing now. Uh, when, a, when a disaster happens, you hit the ground, and I know you have a playbook that you do. But what would you say, how do you prioritize? There's so much that has to happen in, in, in a certain order in order to get, get what you need to the people who need it. So what would you say is most needed during these crises? How do you prioritize? Yeah, well, I think the answer to what is most needed goes back to kind of Sandra's point about visibility and information. Um, and 
information is always the thing that that's needed most. Now, there is a ton of information available after a disaster, but it's finding that right information, that actionable information. Um, you know, to Adam's point about where supplies are, uh, even if that information is somewhere it's stranded, somebody knows it, but it's not being shared to the right people, it, it's useless information, right? Um, so finding the answers to the right questions, I think, is, is what's needed most. Now, if you want to talk about, you know, what products and, you know, kind of tangible things are, are needed most for us, we always need transportation support, right? That's what our partners need. Uh, until we have, I think I've said this a hundred times already this week, but until we have Star Trek replicators, um, we there's going to be a need for trucks, right? Um, because the disaster relief, literally 60 to 80% of humanitarian spending goes towards those logistics activities, getting things from where they are manufactured to where they can be consumed, right? And um, and so transportation is always the biggest need that, that we're going to work with during a disaster. And it's the same for all of our nonprofit partners. And they need cash to do that. They need, you know, other resources to do that. But it is, you know, logistics is, is highest on the list for us. Kathy, I'm wondering, you guys, Walgreens was really at ground zero during the COVID-19 pandemic because so much of the supplies and emergency things that were needed were sold by you guys. You had kind of your own personal emergency in terms of getting product on the shelves. And I'm wondering if you could speak to either that specifically or the industry in general. Did we get better at dealing with natural disasters because we got better at dealing with our own supply chain disruptions thanks to COVID-19? Absolutely. So for Walgreens, for sure, um, COVID-19 changed a lot for us. And, and one of the things um, was how quickly we were able to mobilize getting product that we didn't have before onto the shelves. And you're right. And, and some of that was in realizing areas where we had to, to change, like maybe the decision-making process, right? Like before you might've gone through months of an approval process to do something, right? We had to be able to pivot a lot more quickly. So we changed a lot of our internal processes so that we could change direction a lot more rapidly. And yes, that absolutely facilitates better response to disaster recovery as well. We became a lot more nimble as a company because of COVID-19 for sure. Well, thank you. Oh, you have we want have some more just, to say that? I wanted to, I actually want to weigh in on that because something Sandra said resonated with me. You know, as I uh, as I've been speaking at events over the spring, I have asked, you know, the people in my audiences, you know, how many of you feel like you are better prepared than you were before the pandemic? And you know, maybe 20% of them raised their hands and, and say, Well, how how many of you feel like you are less prepared than you were before the pandemic? Um, and, you know, maybe a few people raise their hands, but I'm like, okay, what about the other 80%? And they're just trying to make it through the day. But the, the point is like, they have figured out they can get through this. They have figured out ways to, you know, take care of themselves. They figured out that they can do these things. And it, the pandemic has, um, I think taught us a lot of preparedness lessons that we honestly, I wish we didn't have to learn. Yeah, well, such lessons. We never want to learn those yeah. lessons, but we certainly are better at better after we have learned them. At this point, I'm going to invite the audience to come in with their own questions for our distinguished expert panel. We have a few minutes in order to entertain as many of those as we can, time permitting. So while we're answering these, please continue to submit those questions by clicking on that Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. So what I'm going to do with these questions is kind of just throw them out and see who bites. And anybody who's willing it is, ha is happy to respond or to elaborate on another person's response. So let's see, uh, let's see what you guys think about some of these questions. This questioner says, could you please comment on the importance of in-transit shipment visibility? You alluded to that a little bit in your presentation. In relation to disaster relief, what sort of solutions are you using to achieve this? Yeah, I Go. think I'll, I'll probably jump in first on that one. Um, okay. Yeah, I mean, there, there's a lot of connectivity platforms out there, right, to make sure that we are um, getting full visibility into, uh, into shipments in real time and making sure that's transmitted back to, um, you know, our customer partners, whether that's 
P44, Macro Point, any, any of those companies really that allow us to make sure that whatever the customer need is, if that's every 15 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour, um, we're ready to give those real-time updates back to the people who really need them most, which are, you know, those those in need, right? And uh, I think if someone's expecting a shipment um, of water to deliver, you know, at this time by this day, it means they might be out, you know, at that point. And if they don't have it by then, um, they have real problems for the next evening. And that's that's what we're trying to avoid. So if we do have um, a, a shipment that's behind for whatever reason, we can immediately contingency plan around that, right? That's that's the importance of visibility in um, in these scenarios. It's not about what's not going to be on a shelf for tomorrow. It's, it's it's really about what what do these people who have nothing else, right? What what are we able to give them now? And if we can't give it to them right now, what what tools do we have at our expense to make sure that we can plan around that and and really, um, you know, if it's an hour delay or two hour delay, which you, again you never want predictability of that delay is what's most important during these times, right? So you can really yeah. communicate effectively, um, kind of create that trust of, of, you know, who's providing that, that relief, but really you want the people who are going through these issues to feel that um, they're fully supported and they're supported by people who have full control over that support and who are really, you know, there with the right tools and, and execution strategies to make sure that they're getting what they need. Sandra, I would assume that Walgreens, you know, everyday system and technology for in transit shipment visibility comes into play in an emergency. It's basically the same system, just, you know, cranked up. I don't know. Is that the case? Absolutely. And that's what you hope you and, you know, like we have um, a headquarters in Deerfield, Illinois. So as long as that's not impacted, then you have a whole group of people and the same technology that you're using to support wherever the event might be occurring. The only thing I would add is definitely, again, about that communication plan. You want to make sure in advance that you've got all the right um, contacts for your provider and, and also for your employees all across uh, the nation so that you can, you can have good communication uh, along with this, the support from the systems in terms of, of tracking and monitoring where, where everything is. Thanks. And how about you, Kathy, in terms of uh, in-transit shipment visibility? I mean, you guys have to have something in place. You obviously rely on your service providers to give you that information, but do you have anything in-house at Allen? What do you do to yeah, achieve yeah. that? Yeah, so we're not using anything in-house, but uh, all of the names that Adam mentioned, we are, uh, we are familiar and friends with. Um, but it is, I, I'm going to take a little bit of a different tact on this in that, um, I, you know, most of our nonprofit partners have are relying on uh, just in time shipments right to a particular location so they can serve a particular community. Um, I, I think about some of the feeding operations you know where they're setting up and they need you know uh, the meat delivered at this time and the propane delivered at this time and when that does not come together, um, they're not able to serve that community and then we have to rely on, uh, other resources. Nobody wants to eat MREs if, you know, there's barbecue available, right? <laughs> um, so, so thinking about utilizing uh, that visibility, not just in, in terms of individual shipments, you know, in that example that I just mentioned, but in terms of aggregate for a community, when you start thinking about the entirety of the resources that are going to be available to uh, to serve a community after disaster, you know, how are we going to provide uh, food, hydration, medical care? Uh, it, we have the technology. The technology exists within the ecosystem, but we need ways to pull all of that together. And that's something that I'm hopeful for in the future to have that, you know, I, you know, I know we'll never have one giant dashboard, but if we no. can get enough players agreeing to have the right conversations at the right time, we know that we'll uh, it will be a better service to those uh, crisis affected communities. Yeah, cooperation, collaboration is key in such instances. So, uh, Kathy, this is a super simple question. You can answer yes or no or, or elaborate just a little bit. But the qu questioner simply wants to know, does Allen operate outside of the U.S.? So absolutely, yes. Um, our primary work is U.S. domestic ground activities, whether that's ground transportation, warehousing, material handling equipment, that's kind of our sweet spot. Um, but we know that uh, most of our nonprofit partners also do international relief work. And so we're often involved in those first mile uh, moves to get things overseas. Uh, but we also have uh, association partners who have 
global networks, right? Um, and so when we can leverage those global networks, when we can leverage those relationships and that trust in other countries to help our, our nonprofit partners, uh, we do that. Um, you know, we're not, we're not gonna, probably not gonna be the ones coordinating, but if we can make at least an introduction or if we can share some information, that's going to be just as impactful for that nonprofit organization who is, you know, just trying to help people. This next question is kind of an interesting one, and I guess I'm going to direct it to Kathy, but anyone else is willing is, is certainly welcome to chime in, because I heard you guys talk a little earlier about the notion of kind of a SWAT team approach to, to getting in there really quick and, and, and providing necessary relief. This questioner says, what do you think of establishing a self-sufficient rapid response force for global disaster relief with airdrop capability? that focuses on immediate SAR or medevac and emergency supply to remote infrastructure denied areas. Yeah, so I, I, I'll jump in here first and then I would love to hear um, Sanders' response because I know they do some of this, but um, I, I think that uh, those types of organizations and there are, or, there are organizations out there who are self-contained, um, you know, I, I can think of a few former military organizations who do that, and then a few corporate organizations who do that. Um, I, I think the questioner is probably referring to uh, search and rescue um, activities here, SAR, search and rescue, um, and medevac. Mm -hmm. it, absolutely needed. I mean, we see that uh, getting to disaster survivors within that first 48, 96 hours is so critical, right? Um, your body starts to shut down if you don't have hydration after uh, after 72 hours. So getting to people very rapidly and being able to do that um, self-sustained uh, is very important, but uh, no man is an island. And so self-sustained self does not mean disconnected um, is my only comment there. Okay, thank you for that. Again, this one may be just for whoever wants to pick up. Oh, wait, does anyone else want to want to chime in for what Kathy just said about that? Any other response? The only thing I wanted to add is, and I'm glad you brought that up because um, restricted areas, that can be really challenging. And um, I know that like for us, you know, kind of like the SWAT team concept, you know, we have a team of people who have um, a lot of contacts uh, for the government in, again, in advance of these events so that they know who to contact to possibly get permission to maybe go into an area and bring in the water and the supplies that are necessary. And I know that a lot of our um, fleet operations and truck drivers um, will, you know, go above and beyond and and kind of put themselves a little bit at risk and be willing to go into those restricted areas and do whatever they can to bring those much needed emergency supplies. Great. Thanks for that. Now, you guys are all experts on this, so you know what to do when an emergency happens. But this question is asking about best practices for companies to utilize ahead of extreme weather events. Maybe these companies aren't as skilled in response to disaster response as you folks are, because this is your everyday thing. But what would be some best practices that you guys would recommend that companies could use in anticipation of what is sure to be the next one, you know, the next extreme weather, weather event? What do you think? Who wants to go? How about uh, how about how about Adam? Do you have any ideas on that, Adam? Yeah, I mean, from from our perspective, it's you know, it's it's a little it's harder for us to be a part of that inventory control you know process that we talked about before. It's it's really how far can we plan ahead as a logistics provider? I know that, and Kathy's mentioned this. Obviously, our partnership with Sander Walgreens the logistics end of it is so important for that, that final step in the process, right? And, and making sure that it's sort of the, uh, the one that, that never fails, but um, you know, it, it's definitely not necessarily part of the, the pre-planning stage. You just need to have the right partnerships with the right companies beforehand that it can react quick enough you know, and, and reliable enough um, in those times of need. So for us, it's, it's really just making sure that we, we know that our clients um, know that we have those capabilities, right? So in, in those times of needs, um, you know, when, when you have this scenario come up, making sure they know what our capabilities are and making sure they know how we are supporting those services within our own four walls, I think is important for our, our shipping community to know, right? So I think um, if we have to start those conversations with shippers to make sure that we are known as a provider who can, who can really deliver in times of need, and that's that, that's how we're getting out in front of that, you know, just making sure that our services are available, um, you know, as they are are really needed. 
Sandra, what about Walgreens acquired wisdom and best practices? Obviously you have them. How might you advise other companies to follow your lead in this way? Well, I think also we kind of touched on this a little bit earlier, like collaborating with each other, like maybe there's an opportunity to do more of that and really learning from each other as um, different companies and forums like this, you know, really getting together and sharing those ideas on how we can all improve. Great. Thank you for that. Uh, this questioner, and I think maybe uh, maybe Kathy could tackle this one. They're saying, could you perhaps supply me with a copy of a disaster plan? Yeah, so it's a terrific question. It actually speaks directly to, to your last question, Bob, um, in that um, there are tons of free resources out there um, to help get businesses ready to, uh, to respond to disaster. Um, I'd point people to ready.gov, R-E-A-D-Y.gov, ready.gov. Um, there are actually templates available there. You can just search uh, disaster response plan, disaster recovery plan on your favorite search engine. You will come up with tons and tons of resources, checklists, anything that you could ever possibly need. Um, but though, uh, to, to your point about like best practices, that plan can't just sit on a shelf. You have to actually exercise it, test it. And you don't want to exercise like just what works. You want to exercise it to the point of failure. You want to make sure that you know what's going to break um, because then you can either mitigate and hope it doesn't break the next time or prepare so that it doesn't break the next time or at least build in some agility for yourself to know, hey, this is, this is going to happen. Here are some ways we can get around it. So uh, I can't just hand you a plan because they have to be specific to your organization, but I can tell you where to go get them. Yeah. I wonder as we're hearing so much more about the ability of artificial intelligence and other aspects of technology to provide you with what if scenarios, modeling scenarios that allow you to perhaps, you know, do exercises on a screen that might be able to help you. I don't know. Yeah, um, we, in, we actually, we have a disaster simulation game, which is not mm. based on, you know, an individual company, but a community response um, that if any organizations out there, you know, want more information about that, it, we just need about 22 people in a couple hours and we're happy to, oh, uh, that to, to do that. Fantastic. I'm sure and that it's would a be lot of fun. <laughs> hugely valuable exercise for people to get involved in. So we are almost out of time. I think there's time for one more question and let me di direct it to all of you, but I wanna start with you, Adam. You guys have kind of touched on this a little bit, but let's elaborate. Whether we work directly in supply chain or for a large organization, what are some ways we can all get involved in providing disaster relief? Adam? Um, yeah, and, and first and foremost, I think, during these times, we just all need to step up every time, right? No matter what the hour and execute. Um, for us, it's, you know, locking the trucks at the fairest price possible that can deliver on time, no matter what. Um, and everyone on this call is a big part of disaster relief from a professional standpoint. But I think the question more is also what, what, what can you do from a personal standpoint? There's always so much we can do as individuals. We can give, we can donate, um, we can help build back. We can maybe, ask our companies to match certain donations, you know, create charitable funding efforts that go a long way for these, these families affected. Um, I think the most important message in that, though, is that there's no bad way to get involved. Um, something is always better than nothing. No idea is a bad one, um, you know, when it comes to contributing to keeping people alive and well um, and helping them, you know, build back their homes and their lives. So, so get involved, um, you know, get passionate about it whenever you can. And literally, however you can, however fits into your lives. And I think it's very important. It'll make you all feel very good. I know that it's a, it, it's a, it's a passion point, right? It's, it's something that, uh, that goes above and beyond. I think um, I mentioned earlier, it's, these, these shipments are very different than just the ones we deliver on a daily basis. And you hear the passion coming from Kathy and what a lot of us are doing with our careers, right, focused on some of these, uh, these issues. And I think um, just understanding the gravity of it is, is really important. I think that should really empower everyone to feel like they they need to get involved and, and contribute, and it, it'll feel good if we do. Isn't it great to end a day feeling like you've made a difference? That's just fantastic. Absolutely, Sandra. What do you think? Uh, how can we get involved from from your standpoint? 
So, you know, Walgreens established an employee benefit fund that assists employees that are experiencing a hardship. So I would say one way that people can get involved is by looking for opportunities that already exist within your company that supports coworkers and the community. And also, many companies have programs or groups that are in place that actively work with, with um, support relief organizations already. Um, so look for opportunities to donate money or volunteer your own time with relief organizations. And then Adam already mentioned uh, company match options, but one thing I would add to that is if they don't already exist, then see if you can establish one within your own company. And I would say also check with local community organizations for donation drives or other opportunities that you can do locally. And additionally, I would say it's important to check in with, the, with these different organizations to see exactly what is needed at that time, because it can be different for different disasters. Great. Thank you for that. And then finally, I'm going to give you the last word, uh, Kathy. Tell us about how people can get involved and specifically how they can get involved with Alan. Yeah, so um, there are tons of ways to get in, involved with Alan. That includes volunteering. Um, that includes uh, utilizing your resources, providing those in-kind services. Um, I, as I mentioned earlier, I want you to put your oxygen mask on yourself first. I want you to take care of your business and make sure that your business is prepared. And that can mean things like creating that business continuity plan. It can be things like bringing the emergency manager for your uh, jurisdiction into your warehouse or into your manufacturing facility, into your, uh, your cross stock so that they see what's happening not only helps protect your business so that they know who, who to help, but it can be a source, uh, a resource for them. Um, uh, you know, Sandra mentioned getting involved with the community organizations, know who they are, right? Know how your expertise and knowledge and skills aligns with the things that they need. Yes, people in Florida do not need wool blankets in the summer, right? So make sure that, that you're, you're being smart about what you're giving them. And I will tell you that um, cash is always the number one way in which all of the nonprofits we work with and our organization um, help to keep the lights on and help to do the good work that we do. So volunteer, uh, donate services or, uh, or um, uh, time, uh, expertise, and uh, give a financial gift. I, I promise that um, you will go to sleep at night feeling good about the work that you've done that day. The timing on this presentation simply could not be better because companies are waking up to the need for some kind of risk management policy to their own comp to their own supply chains and extrapolating that to what's going on in the larger world in terms of all these disasters. All of you, all three of you are doing such fantastic work and I want to thank you all for joining us today. Kathy Fulton of Allen, Sandra McCarthy at Walgreens, Adam Moreau with Redwood Logistics, presenter of today's webinar. Thank you so much, all of you. We're going to look here at a screen that tells you how you can donate to Allen. There's a QR code right there. You can snap a picture of it if you want. And there's a website, allenaid.org slash donate. Once again, thanks to our great speakers today. Thank you, audience, for listening in and for your fantastic questions. Everybody have a great and safe day.